Robot Talk is the podcast that sits down with robot enthusiasts from around the world and asks them the questions you always wanted answered. Like, can the robot assistant learn? And how does that thing work? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Robot Talk. I'm your host, Claire Asher, and this week's episode is all about smart homes. From sensing and monitoring technology to home assistants and companion robots. But first, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to Robot Talk through your favourite podcast provider. It really helps the podcast and means you'll be the first to hear the latest episodes. Another way to find out about new episodes is our email newsletter, which you can sign up to on our website by going to robottalk.org. And don't forget to enter our competition for a chance to win your very own Robot Talk t-shirt. For more information about the competition and how to enter, check out robottalk.org. So, without further ado, it's time for me to introduce this week's guest. I recently had a really interesting discussion with Patricia Shaw from Aberyst with University, all about home assistance robots and robot learning and development. Today, I'm speaking to Patricia Shaw, a senior lecturer at Aberyst with University, working on technology for assistive living. Hi, Patricia. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. So you're currently leading on the establishment of a new smart home lab at Aberyst with University. Um, so what will this lab look like and what kinds of research will you be conducting there? So the lab itself looks like a house, a home. It is a, a three bedroom bungalow uh, and this is fully functional in the sense of people could actually stay here for days, nights, weeks. Um, but I say it's essentially a research facility to be able to explore and understand research within the home environment. Mm. Um, and specifically, we're looking at assisted living type research, but it could be used for lots of different things. Okay. I'm assuming this house is full of robots and sensors and all kinds of things. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, sure. So it is indeed full of lots of different sensors. We've got lots of sensors monitoring what's going on in the environment, what activities are taking place in the environment, uh, people inside the house. But also we have robots that we're looking at, uh, ranging everything from companion-based robots that look like pets and small robots that can run around, all the way up to larger robots that are actually able to assist with specific tasks. So we've got a large mobile robot with a big arm on it that's able to pick things up and, and mm. hand those to you. Okay. So is it tailored in any way to specific kinds of assistive living or is it is it intended to be quite a broad remit? So the specific focus that we're starting on is looking at uh, supporting older adults uh, in independent living later mm. on in life. So being able to make sure they're not having accidents or if there is an accident uh, to be able to report that yeah. and therefore to support the families, the informal carers, uh, social care workers and healthcare practitioners with that care provided within the home environment. Um, but it could be used for much broader applications. Okay. It sounds really exciting. It must be a really fun project to work on. It's definitely fun getting it all set up. There's lots of new equipment and uh, technology to try out. And so testing all kinds of different things, uh, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess for the purposes of like a research lab, it's, it's maybe less of an issue. But obviously, like um, things like privacy and security are really important. If you were to set this up in someone's home for real, um, are, you, are you looking at any of that kind of stuff in the smart home lab? Absolutely. I mean, we're very keen to actually have the research that we're doing solving real world problems. And so we are working with uh, council, social care providers, social housing in order to address real problems. And so therefore, privacy is a key concern that we have to address up front. It's not something that we're sort of ignoring and leaving into the mm. sideline to deal with later on. So it is a big part of what we're, we're incorporating into the design uh, and considerations for the house. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when will the lab be, be ready for researchers to start working there? 
I think it's, a, it's an ongoing project in <laughs> sure. many regards. There'll always be new things we want to test. Uh, we are gradually getting it set up. So we're hoping to have um, experiments being able to run in it uh, by the summer. Okay. Uh, but certainly it's, it's uh, always going to be new technology coming in to, for testing and of trying course. out. Yeah, yeah. And you previously worked on um, developmental robotics. Um, and one project of yours that really caught my eye was looking at how robots can learn like human babies and children do. So you know, starting out from learning how to move and eventually learning how to understand the world around them through play. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about that project and what you discovered? So yeah, that was a really interesting, fun project where we learned so much about how the brain develops, how children learn. Yeah. And we were really looking at how uh, a robot can follow that same sort of learning process as a human child. Um, so we were looking at how a robot can perhaps learn to coordinate its um, motor movements with what it's sensing. Mm -hmm. So being able to learn how to move its eyes to look at different targets, learning to coordinate its hand movements with what it's seeing to be able to even reach to an object. And then having got that kind of coordination between uh, what it's seeing and what it's uh, picking up, then trying to understand what those objects actually are. So learning mm. like a child through play type behavior. So if you push a ball, it rolls. Whereas if you push a cube, then it will just slide. Mm. And so we're really trying to model that, that process and working very closely with psychologists to understand how the brain works and how children go through that process to try and build up models that a robot can then learn in a very similar way. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, looking at human baby, they they really start from scratch when it comes to kind of learning learning everything about how their body works and how the world works. Um, what what do you see as the advantages of of applying that to robotics as opposed to kind of pre programming a robot with with rules and and you know all of that information in advance? It is a good question. So one of the things we're really keen on is, is that you say human children, they're amazing learners. They soak up everything and they're capable of constantly learning. We're still learning as adults. Yeah. Um, and what we really wanted to try and achieve with the robots is to develop mechanisms where robots could learn uh, in a more flexible and adaptable way and constantly continue to learn and mm. explore for themselves rather than having to pre-program everything because you can't predict what it's actually yeah. going to encounter later on. So giving it that ability and those mechanisms to continuously learn and to explore and discover for itself as well, uh, not having to tell it what to go and try and do, uh, but actually go out and explore and try new things. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, I suppose in, in the animal world, the, the ability to learn has made animals much more adaptable to changing environments and you know, new things that, that they couldn't have kind of, they couldn't have through instinct. Yes, absolutely. Very much so. Um, and so how do these findings about developmental robotics then feed into your current work on assistive living? Like, um, you know, do you think that any of these robot learning approaches could be helpful um, for creating more adaptable robot companions or assistants? Definitely. So within the home environment, we might think of it as quite a sort of simple environment, but actually it's one of the most complex environments yeah. for robots to actually work in. And no two people's homes are ever going to be the same. And what people might expect or want the robot to do is also going to vary from home to home. Mm. So if we're actually able to build in some of that adaptive learning and development of new skills within the robot, then hopefully you'll be able to survive much better within a home <laughs> environment and yeah. be much more useful in the long term as well. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to have have a robot that can learn, um, I guess, maybe not starting from the position of a baby, but starting from some base knowledge and then adapting to the, the specifics. Yeah, absolutely. So we wouldn't be sending baby robots out into <laughs> the home by any means. Uh, but hopefully, yes, we can have some kind of common ground, but it's that mechanisms and the ability to continue to learn that's going to be really important. And the ability to adapt as, as the joints wear out on a robot mm. as well can actually be very useful. So you might not have to start learning from scratch, but it might well have to adapt over time as, it, uh, as the robot mechanisms change. Yeah, yeah. It's funny, I think quite a few of people I've spoken to on the podcast have kind of described like current robotics technology as almost like a toddler in kind of like the way that they think and interact with the world as compared to like maybe what what people's expectations are of robots being much more advanced than the technology has got there. The toddler analogy is one that's been made frequently in my conversations. 
I think I'd certainly agree with that. And, and I think to some extent, movies has got a lot to answer for in terms of how yeah. people perceive robotics. Um, and so, yeah, there's definitely an expectation that they're going to be much more sophisticated than they actually are. And it's, it's actually a long, long way away, uh, that level of ability. Yeah, yeah. When I when I see videos of robots, um, I I try and apply that. I'm like, just think of it like a toddler, and then it just all makes so much more sense. <laughs> the classic one: the robot falling down the stairs. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so we've got an audience question um, submitted by L on Instagram. Um, L says, "Will AI contribute on assistive living?" Inevitably, it will. And there's so many different areas in which AI can contribute to assisted living whether that's from solving tasks that we might think are actually quite straightforward, such as uh, putting the, the dishes in the dishwasher, uh, all the way through to actually being able to communicate more naturally with a person. Mm. Um, one area we are quite keen to sort of look at with using AI in assisted living is actually long-term tracking of behaviours and how behaviours might change over time. Okay. If somebody does have a long-term condition such as dementia, then actually being able to monitor and use AI to see how that's changing over time could actually really help to then adapt and uh, address the changing needs of that person mm. over a long period of time. So there's lots of areas that AI can contribute and hopefully it will uh, be beneficial in the long term. Yeah, that's really interesting. I guess I often think of like assistive robots as kind of, you know, helping out around the house, helping load the dishwasher, do the laundry, that kind of thing. But but what you're talking about sounds more like the kind of care you would get from a human where they can kind of notice changes in your behavior or say, oh, I think, you know, you're struggling with this that you weren't before. And that kind of thing that really at the moment we we only get from a human carer. Yes. And I think one thing we're really keen on as well is actually having the house and the technology in the house assisting with some of the monitoring that perhaps a care worker when they come in they have to check a whole long list of things to mm. see has the person eaten have they uh, got dressed and washed and have they been taking care of themselves and that can take away time from the human relationship that the person has yeah. during that short period of time and so if we can actually develop technology and use that technology to say, this is what's been happening in the house, this is what the person's been doing, then hopefully that will mean that the time spent with a real person is actually much more meaningful uh, mm -hmm. in the relationship. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, when they hear AI, especially, you know, nowadays, they, they think of, you know, things like ChatGPT, these, these large language models that are fantastic at making fluid sounding speech. But of course, AI is much, much, much bigger than that. And I was chatting the other week to someone who's using machine learning to try and make uh, robots more adaptable to kind of different home environments and the specifics of, of you know, people's preferences and all of that kind of thing. So it's, it's really, there's a lot of different ways that it could be applied. Oh, it is. It's a huge field in its own rights. And yes, machine learning and these large language models like ChatGPT are just one small example of it. Uh, but the opportunities for making use of large amounts of data that we're getting through those sensors in the home will definitely uh, contribute to hopefully better care in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I mentioned kind of privacy and security earlier in our conversation. I guess there's also this slightly sticky subject of trust between the person who's who's living in that that robotic home and and the robot and and you know maybe there might be situations where the robot could um tell a healthcare professional something that the user of the robot might not necessarily want to be told or they might feel that their trust has been broken and I don't know how how we deal with these kinds of issues. Do you, do you have any thoughts about that? I assume this is something that comes up a lot in your, your line of work. It certainly does come up. Uh, essentially, what we're keen to do is work with the people uh, and to address mm. their concerns and how we can actually design the system around what it is they want it to do, um, rather than just sort of building a system and 
sort of imposing it on people. Mm. And the more uh, transparent we can be about what's going on inside the system, uh, then we're hoping that will actually help to deal with and address some of the trust concerns. But there is definitely this issue of how much does the robot disclose, how much does the census reveal about what's been going on in the home that the person might not want to have shared. And that's definitely something that we will be looking into in the future. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it it is also a sort of ethical, philosophical issue that is bigger than just robotics, right? Because sometimes people don't necessarily want things that might be what's in their best interest, right? Especially when you're talking about people who are dealing with dementia or, you know, issues like that, where sometimes somebody has to say, well, this is what's best for you, even if it's not what you necessarily want. Yes, and I think that is a a tricky discussion and that's why we are taking in the views from the different stakeholders because, yeah, at some point, sometimes their families might recommend things for them that they might not be quite so keen on, but actually it does enable them to stay in their homes for longer. And quite often if you're able to sort of say, this will help you stay in your home for longer and that's what you want to, to be able to do rather than move into a care home, then there is more willingness to actually adopt some of these technologies. Mm -hmm. Um, But it it can be a very difficult uh, process to go through. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like you, um, you know, work quite closely with sort of end users of this technology. Do you think that people are broadly positive and excited about, about the opportunities that these kind of assistive robots present? Or is there some kind of anxiety or fear relating to it or probably a bit of both (laughs) we've had some very mixed responses from it so far Uh, I mean everything from no definitely not in my home Mm. to yes please when can I get it and I mean it is also when you having that discussion if you go back to the, the trust question then Things like cameras, people are very worried about the idea of possibly having a camera in their home. Uh, But if you start to say, well, if you did have a camera in your home, but just in these locations or only turned on when you press an emergency or Mm. um, that it was able to actually detect that there had been an accident and get you help, then actually starting to give context and justification for that technology, they can actually be a lot more accepting of it rather than just saying, right, we're going to install a camera in your home that's going to be monitoring you. Uh, But actually explaining why that's useful, then they do start to say, oh, yeah, actually, that could be really useful. And and maybe I wouldn't have an issue with that Mm. quite so much. So it is giving it that context and justification. And say through discussions with them, it's, it's opening up and addressing those issues and concerns. Yeah. Continuing on the theme of talking about how people react to robots, um, you've been part of the organizing team for um, ABBA Robotics Week over the last six years, which aims to engage members of the public in robotics and the research going on at Aberystwyth University. Um, so what has your experience been running this kind of event and, and how do people react to the robots that you're, you're demonstrating? It's been really amazing. I've had so many great conversations over the years with so many people. Uh, At the robotics events, we have a wide range of different robots that we take down from large sort of four by four sized robot vehicles all the way down to uh, smaller robots uh, like um, dogs and cats that you can actually, Mm. or people that built themselves. uh, Okay. And so there's very different reactions to the different types of robots that we have. And initially, some people kind of very nervous about some of them, (laughs) others just just loving it. But the general response is just amazed at what it is that is capable of doing. Uh, I mean, yes, the films do over-exaggerate what robots are capable of, but actually when you show them what a robot can currently do and what it could potentially be used for and there's generally quite quite a bit of amazement and interest in that wow mm. I really I didn't know that you could do that that'd be really useful yeah and so it is it's really eye-opening and um, and it's great to actually be able to take it out into the community and talk to people and show what's what's currently happening uh, especially in the local area yeah definitely um are people kind of surprised by the diversity of different robots you've got on display Yeah, I think they are. Uh, I think there's a very stereotypical view that when people think of a robot, they've got one particular image in mind. And so when they see the the array of different robots that we do uh, tend to take to those events, then 
like, yeah, wow, well, it's very much of an eye opener for mm. them. Yeah. And you run these events, um, if I'm remembering correctly, in the, the bandstand down, is that down on the beach? It is, yes. So down on the seafront, uh, the council has a, a bandstand, which is used for quite a few different events. But it means that we get a really good audience of just people on holiday as much as anything yeah. else, as well as the local community coming along and just being able to drop in for the day. Uh, there's activities for the kids to take part in. Uh, they can drive robots around a maze and just learn about all the different uh, uh, activities that even that they can get started with straight away so uh, various kits and resources that we can point to to get them started yeah I mean yeah it's it's, it's fantastic that you have that kind of passerby like foot traffic of people who just happen to be there didn't know the event was happening and can kind of wander in because I think often these kinds of public engagement events there's this problem that you're, you know, you're getting people who are already really excited and enthusiastic about robots and so heard about the event and the people who, you know, lots of people just miss out and don't know about it or don't, you know, make the effort to go. So having that that really prominent location seems like a, a fantastic um, bonus to the event. Yeah, it definitely makes a difference. Uh, we have, I mean, during COVID, we had to move elsewhere uh, yeah. for one year and we definitely got a reduction in the number of traffic and it was those people that already knew about it that were coming. Mm. Um, but we do have people that travel quite some distance to come and see it each year, mm. uh, as well as uh, people who are, just happen to be on the holidays. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a really nice uh, experience, a very fun day. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would love to come sometime. I will, I will manage to, to make the trip up to Wales and, and come along for it. Well, it'll be happening again this year. I think it's June 16th. <laughs> okay. Patricia, it's been lovely talking to you today. I've been chatting to Patricia Shaw, a senior lecturer at Aberystwyth University. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Robot Talk, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast and leave a review to let us know what you think. And make sure you check out our social media channels to see a photo of some of the robots at Aberystwyth University's Smart Home Lab, which Patricia and I talked about. We're at Robot Talk Pod on all the socials. Next week, I'm chatting to Stephen Oram from Nudge the Future Fiction, all about applied science fiction and the quirks and perils of new technology. Until then, I've been Claire Asher, and this has been Robot Talk. Robot Talk is brought to you by the Hamlin Centre, Imperial College London. <laughs>